So I'm really, really happy to be here to present you um, what is a persistent memory. Uh, so as Pierre uh, said, I'm a senior researcher at INRIA in France. You can see my strong accent, so I am French. Um, I'm not a theoretical guy, I'm a system guy. Uh, so it means that I am interested by, not by the theory behind uh, the computer systems, I'm interested by uh, how we can make efficient applications. So here, during this talk, my focus will be on performance and how we can use efficiently a persistent memory. So what is a persistent memory? It's just a happy wedding between a volatile memory, uh, which is a classical memory, and a persistent storage. So what it means exactly is that you have the properties of a memory. You have the byte addressability, which means that uh, from the processor, with lo simple load and stores, you can access the, the persistent memory. The main difference with a volatile memory is that when you shut down your computer, you will still have your data in your persistent memory. So it acts, it behaves like a persistent storage. Where it's very interesting, it's that you have the properties of memory, the durability of a hard drive, and almost the performance of a volatile memory. So to illustrate, from in terms of performance, uh, when you access to a volatile memory, you are at the scale of the nanosecond, um, 80 nanosecond for a read, and with a persistent memory, you just divide by two your latency. So it means that you can almost uh, uh, use your persistent memory it's as fast as a volatile memory. Where it, it changed a lot, uh, it's the difference between a non-volatile memory and a hard drive. Because as you can see, we have a factor 1000 between the persistent memory and the, the storage. If you take uh, NVMe, you are at the scale of 250 microseconds. And if you take the most efficient NVMe that you can imagine, you will be at the scale of 10 microseconds, not the scale of nanoseconds. So it means that we can have performance with durability with a persistent memory. So, how can we use that? Um, at the hardware level, uh, a persistent memory is just a memory. So you have a memory dim that you plug uh, as any other memory. And it expo it's exposed by the BIOS, just like any memory bank. After, at the system level, we don't use the persistent memory as a memory bank. So we have a small issue. Uh, with uh, a persistent memory is that we want to retrieve our data after uh, when the, the computer boots. For that, we need uh, names. We have to associate names to data. And the, the way we do that, uh, usually in system, is by using um, a file system abstraction. So Linux, what Linux do, it will simply uh, store a file system inside the persistent memory just to give names to your data. You will use a pass uh, with, uh, let's imagine, the, 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 the file hello. And uh, this pass is just a name for data that is stored in persistent memory, just like you store your data in your hard drive. You will have exactly the same abstraction for, for Linux. You have a small difference between uh, a normal file system and a file system used for uh, a persistent memory is that the file system is in direct access mode. I will show you what it means. It, at, at a high level, it means that you will just bypass all the software stacks that we use to access a file system that we usually uh, have <coughs> in order to directly access the persistent memory. After, if you take a look at your persistent memory when it's used as a file system and you inspect the bytes, you will see exactly a normal file system, a standard file system with uh, uh, directories, uh, inodes, uh, etc., etc. So we can use the persistent memory as 
any disk with open read-write clause uh, primitives, which means that for the developer, um, we just have a very efficient storage that we can use as it as is. Uh, when you will read write uh, to your persistent memory, your performance will be amazing. But we can do better. So to explain uh, what, uh, what is the problem, I will just try to recall you how we access a file system uh, in, uh, um, with Linux. So for a standard uh, file system access, um, the problem that we have is that the the processor is able to load and store data from the memory at the byte granularity. With a hard drive, uh, let's imagine uh, a hard drive, a SSD, NVMe, whatever, you cannot access directly the hard drive at the byte granularity. You can only access the, the, the storage at the sector granularity, which means 512 bytes, probably. And the CPU is unable to directly access the, the, the storage. You can, when you execute load and store instructions from the CPU, you will load and store the data from your memory. But with the hard drive, you have to use another API. You have to send commands to the hard drive, which will move the data from the hard drive to the physical address space. So here you have the physical address space, just to be sure. Uh, it's just the views that you have at the hardware level for, for the memory buses. So how can we access a file? Uh, traditionally, what we do, uh, we use the, the, the volatile memory as a cache for the hard drive. So basically, we, uh, we store a copy of our files inside the volatile memory and we work directly uh, from the volatile memory when we access a file. So the primitive that is able to do that uh, uh, with Linux is named mmap. mmap is a very powerful function that takes a file, takes an address, a virtual address in a process and load the file in your process, in the address space of your process. So when you use uh, when we want to access the file uh, to, what we do, we use mmap, which load the file in your physical address space, and then uh, Linux leverage the page table to uh, map in the virtual address space of the process the content of the file. So it's very easy. So you have your process that uh, load and store uh, data in the virtual uh, address space, when you have a load or store, it's converted to a physical address uh, by the page table, and you access your data of, of your files that are located in volatile memory. And the volatile memory here acts uh, as a cache for your hard drive. So it means that if you, mm, you power down uh, your system at any time, the last write that you have inside the volatile memory will not be propagated to the hard drive. It's okay. Okay. It's no, not too technical, I hope. Okay, so it's very costly and very inefficient, and we kill uh, absolutely all the possible perfor good performance of uh, a persistent memory if we do that. Why? It's because we have to copy the, the, the content of the hard drive in the volatile memory, so it's costly, it takes time. And uh, when we modify the content of the file in volatile memory, we have to um, write back the, the content of the volatile memory in the hard drive. It's very costly. And the system, the Linux, do that regularly. So it means that you just work on your file, you modify it, and sometimes Linux uh, copy the content of the volatile memory to the hard drive. Uh, so it's costly. You will uh, slow down a lot your application. If we use exactly the same system for a persistent memory, we have a very efficient persistent memory that is able to run at uh, 100 uh, nanoseconds. And after, if we use the volatile memory as a cache for the persistent memory, we will just kill our performance because we will copy 
the content from the persistent memory to the volatile memory, which is very inefficient. So, <coughs> with the persistent memory, what we can do at the end, the persistent memory is a memory, we can access it directly without any abstraction. We don't need a cache to access the persistent memory. Since the processor is able to, the load and store uh, sent by the, the, the CPU are just, ar uh, just arrive in the persistent memory and executed in place without any transformation. So what Linux is doing with what we name the direct access file system, is that when you use MMAP, Linux will simply take the content of the persistent memory and map it, map it directly in your uh, virtual address space without any uh, transformation, uh, without any copy, you will have an access in place to your data. At the end, what uh, Linux is exactly doing, Linux use the metadata of the, of the file system, so the names, just to be able to retrieve the, the, the content, your data, the, the content of the files, Linux is also using the, the file system abstraction to allocate a new file, a new data, to extend it. You will use ftruncate, for example, if you want to, to increase the size of your, of your data in persistent memory. So we use the, the file system abstraction uh, to allocate, create, and uh, delete data. And then for the access, we directly access to the content of the file. So we, we have the two, the best of the two worlds, if you want. Okay, so you are able to use a persistent memory. So when you, so I, I, I forgot to, to say that. Since I'm a system guy, I really enjoy coding. And uh, what we will do, I will give you uh, during less than one hour, uh, uh, some information on how you can use a persistent memory. And then you will do a lab uh, during two hours where you will implement uh, um, a system to boost the performance of your IOs. So you don't have a persistent memory in your computer, so we will simulate that by using volatile memory. But you will see it's very efficient. Uh, you, you, you can. The, when you will have a persistent memory, you just have you will have to take your code and use it to have amazing performance when you will access a hard drive. So okay, so just to to access the our persistent memory, what we do, we open a file, and here this command, the open, you don't have to see it as an open. So we use the name uh, file one, um, uh, the just to, to, to it's just the name. What is important here, we use the flag ocreate. And the flag ocreate tells, okay, if the file does not exist, create it. It's an allocation. Here, what you have to see is that we are allocating a data in persistent memory. It's not really a file creation. So uh, we create uh, our file. If the file already exists, we reuse it. So we use the name just to, to, to it's the name of the file. Then what we do, so we have the file, we can give a size to the, to the file. For that, we use the function ftruncate. Ftruncate take a file descriptor and a size and will extend the, the, the file, uh, the, the size of the file. Here, what we are doing, we are not, the, the first instruction uh, allocate the data in the storage and give it a name. The second one gives a size to the data. So we fix the size. It's just like a, a malloc, if you want, in persistent memory. Just we use the file system abstraction for that. Then we have to use mmap. So with a very strange flag that you have here, uh, map shared validate pipe map sync. That, tell, that tells to Linux, okay, I want to use my file in direct access mode. So I don't want to use the uh, Linux patch cache. I want to map directly the, the, the content in my process. So you do that. Uh, here you have the address where you want to map the, the file, null. Any address is correct for us. Uh, the size that you want to map. Uh, we want to access to the persistent memory in read-write. 
and uh, we have this French flag, and that's all. At this step, the address is just a pointer to your persistent memory, and you can use your persistent memory as any other memory. So you can write uh, something in persistent memory like that. So uh, it's a normal access to uh, as for any memory. And it works. So in four or five lines, what is interesting here, I really enjoy the abstraction that was proposed by Linux. Because what we see is that we really have uh, this uh, notion of naming where we reuse the file system abstraction, and then we have the memory. And we can see that a memory and a, story, uh, a file system and a memory are not so far from one from each other. OK? Now you shut down your computer, and the persistent memory is still there. You don't have anything to do. So when you reboot, you just have to reopen your file, and you will find your content uh, as is, and continue to work. OK. Playing with, sorry? Uh, it uh, don't need to load uh, uh, from persistent memory to, uh, to, memory. to volatile memory. It's just because of this flag ah. that say uh, I want to bypass the Linux patch cache simply. Okay, so it's easy. At the, end, at the end, you can see that in uh, five lines of code, you are able to use a persistent memory. You can do what you want. Uh, it will work. But uh, life is never so easy, unfortunately. Uh, the problem is that the, the a persistent memory is not a normal memory. At some point, you can have crash at any time. So we have to do something to, to make our data co consistent. We will see that. So the problem that we have is that you can have a crash at any time. So let's imagine I write a, a crazy application where uh, I have some Pokemons and uh, stuff like that. And uh, so you have a data structure here with a name. And you use the code that I presented to access the volatile memory here. So we have a pointer to uh, our structure where we have identifier, and I want to write the name of my Pokemon, which is Pikachu. OK, it's easy. The problem that you will have here is that if you have a crash in the middle of the string copy, so it's a plain string copy, you copy from memory to memory, it works. OK. If you have a crash in the middle, at the end, what you will find in persistent memory may be uh, the null string, okay, you will know, okay, if I have the null string, probably I had a crash and I can correct that. Or you can find Pikachu, the whole Pikachu, okay, uh, in this case, you have a valid name. The problem that you will have after the crash is that if you find the, the, the name Pika, just Pika, it's not a valid name, uh, Pika. It never existed. Uh, the valid names are Pikachu, null, but Pika is not a name that existed at any time. If you imagine here that you have a key value store where you, you have accounts for, for users, uh, it means simply that uh, if you have the crash in the middle, that you will have a phantom name, uh, Pika, that nobody will know because the, the user is named Pikachu. Uh, and so we have to do something. We have to define, abstract, to use abstractions to, to be able to define what is the correct state when you reboot your machine and uh, how, you, uh, how you can ensure the consistency of your data when you, after a crash. So for that, we have many solutions, uh, of course, because it's, it's a well-known uh, area. Uh, the basic idea is that we can define uh, what we name failu failure atomic blocks. So a failure atomic block is a block of code that is entirely executed, or not at all, but you cannot have something in the middle. So we will simulate, of course, because we can have crash in the middle of, uh, 
of a block, but the effects of the block have to be executed entirely or not at all at the end. Okay, so we have different implementation techniques. Uh, you have a lot of high-level libraries. The, you have the well-known uh, PMDK, which is uh, uh, implemented by uh, Intel for the, the Optane DC. Um, and you have uh, Romulus, you have a lot of different uh, uh, frameworks that provide this failure atomic block uh, abstractions. So if you want to use them, you can. What I want to show you is how we, can, we could build these uh, frameworks. So what we will do, we will try to build failure atomic blocks manually, uh, just to, to try to grasp how we can build a high, higher level uh, library. So it's easy. If when you have this kind of problem, what you want is an atomic block. So we just need a flag to say, uh, is the atomic block entirely executed or not? Here, why it's interesting to have this committed is just that with a single write, uh, I can validate my uh, name or not. So it's an atomic operation. We just need a single write at uh, the, the, the word level. And uh, at the end, you will have something that works, does not work. So if we imagine a theoretical machine which provides sequential consistency, it does not work also. I will explain why, what. But at a high level, we can imagine doing something like that. So we have a crash, we map uh, our file uh, in, in our virtual address space, and if the committed flag is not uh, true, it means that we had a crash, so we just have to write the name of Pikachu and then we validate. So the first problem that we have, the hardware is really not friendly because the hardware was not uh, designed for a persistent memory. It was designed for a volatile memory. It's not exactly the same thing. So the first problem that we have is the problem of uh, out of order execution. So the, the processor as a pipeline uh, will uh, fetch instructions in the pipeline and uh, put them and execute them in any order at the end. You have a semantic, you have a memory model, of course. But uh, we don't know exactly which... Here we have an Intel, we can suppose a TSO memory model. But we will not be sure if, if we try to use the same code on as another machine, we will have another memory model and we need something. So the problem that we can have is that the processor can invert the two operations. So in this case, you will write that your transaction is committed, but the name is not valid at all because it was not yet executed. So you have something that does not work. So the first idea that we have in this case is to add a memory barrier. It does not work at all. So what is a memory barrier, a memory fence? It's just an instruction that prevents any uh, reordering in the processor. So when you will find this instruction, it means that the processor will execute the Pikachu, uh, then the memory fence, and then the committed. The processor cannot execute the committed before the Pikachu. But when I say execute, it's something that I, we have to define. Executing an instruction for the processor means make the instruction visible to the other cores. It's not really the execution by itself. So here what we have is that we are sure that if, so I execute this code on one core, I am running a thread on another core, the seconds of instruction tell me that if the other core C committed equal true, in this case, the other core will see that Pikachu, uh, the name is Pikachu. But it's between two cores. I don't say anything about memory. Uh, behind, the, the CPU can fl flush the cache lines in any order. So the visibility between the processor is correct, but in memory, maybe that 
my processor for any reason will uh, write back the committed before uh, the Pikachu, just because I have a collision, uh, um, I, I need space in my cache and uh, I have to find some space and uh, uh, I, uh, I write back committed. So after my crash, I will find an incorrect state in persistent memory. So just using memory fence uh, is not enough in our case. Okay, so I reuse what uh, Israelevich uh, proposed uh, seven years ago, uh, which is really an amazing paper if you want to read it, uh, that defines how we can use correctly a persistent memory. Um, and defi uh, he, he defines the, the high level properties that we need, a uh, semantic that, that we need. I will not uh, present the the semantic, I, I, I just want to, to give you the intuition on, uh, of how we can use the, the instructions before. Um, I'm pretty sure that first we have to play with uh, Legos and then we have uh, to build uh, the theory of the Legos. Uh, it's important to do stuff before. So the basic idea is that uh, we need two new instructions uh, to give an order when we propagates data to persistent memory, to the memory itself. So we have two instructions, two new. The first one is PWB, which is persistent write back. And these instructions uh, will add the cache line that contains address uh, in a queue, uh, a FIFIO queue uh, of data that has to be propagated to persistent memory. Physically, the PWB is, does not have a queue. Uh, at the end, the, the PWB simply takes the cache line, put it on the bus, and the bus is a FIFO bus between the memory and the, and the, the processor. So just by, by sending data uh, on the memory bus, that's enough to, to answer the, the order. Okay. But that's not enough because the PWB itself is an instruction and can be reordered with any other instructions. So we have to define the orders, uh, the order of the instruction. And for that, we need a new instruction, which is named PFANS, persistent fans, memory barrier, um, that prevents the reordering of the read, the load, the stores. No, the store, sorry, only the stores, it's important. Uh, that prevent the reordering of the stores and of the PWB. With that, we can have an order when we access, uh, when we propagate data to persistent memory. So, my, my simple code where I just, for the moment, I just want to write Pikachu somewhere in memory, uh, as you can see. The code is becoming more and more and more complex. The result is that just to write a single string in memory, uh, look at what you need. You need five, seven uh, lines of code. It's efficient when you do that. So how it works? Um, we will first va uh, write uh, the name, okay? Then we will say, okay, I unqueue the write back of Pikachu uh, in my uh, in my core. Then I want to answer uh, that I cannot commit, I cannot send the commit uh, data to my persistent memory before the name. For that, I need a, a fence here. I have the persistent fence. Then I can send, uh, I can write committed equal true. And at the end, I can uh, unqueue the committed. Why I need it? It's just for the next, uh, the next um, transaction that I need it. I have to commit this one before the, the next one. Okay, so here we have a total order because we have an explicit dependency between name and name. So the processor will never execute uh, two instructions that access the same data in a revert order. Otherwise, you will have. Uh, um, a random value. If you write uh, x equal 1 and then x equal 2 and at the end the result is x, x equal 1, the computer is totally crazy. It does not make sense. So 
Here you have a, an explicit data dependency between these two instructions. After you have the fence that ensures that you cannot execute the committed or the PWB, you cannot make them visible uh, before this uh, PWB. So we are sure that we will execute committed equal true after the PWB. And then we enqueue the committed. So it means that if committed reach the memory, the persistent memory, we are sure that Pikachu reached also the, the memory. And we have a correct order. So we have this uh, invariant at the end. Yes? Uh, what is the value of the name is longer than the hash line size? So we have to deal with the Yes. Yes. And uh, it's something that can really become complex when you develop, when you, because what we manipulate as developers uh, um, are data, are variab variable. Uh, and here we have to play with the cache line. So if we have a very really huge buffer, we will have to call several times PWB. For that, the, the Intel processor as an instruction that flush entirely the, the, the cache, if you need. Uh, it's a kind of uh, superpower uh, PWB, uh, which solves the problem when you don't know where are your cache lines, which happens quite often. Okay. The problem is that we often need stronger guarantees. Here, I am just playing with the effect, uh, not with the execution. I say, OK, the effect of my PWB here, um, my, my, sorry, my PWB is executed uh, after the other one, etc. But for the moment, um, it's just a speculation. My cache lines are still in queues. I don't know if they reach the, the persistent memory. I don't have any guarantees. When I have this code here, so let's imagine you have two threads. Uh, in one thread, you create the account uh, of Pikachu, and uh, you have a synchronization between the two threads in volatile memory. So I just need a flag, OK, to say uh, the, the user is created. If so here you, you will uh, write OK equal true. In the other thread, you are waiting for OK. And when OK becomes true, we have a memory funds to enforce the ordering because we want to be sure that we will send the message only after uh, the OK equal true. We want to be sure that we send the hack if OK is equal true for the correctness. So I send my message. But at the end, I don't prove anything. Maybe that my message is sent to the user, but for the moment, my cache line that contain Pikachu is still in flight in my uh, memory bus. So it means that I will say to the user, OK, your tweet is sent. The user will be happy. At the end, I have a crash, and the data disappears. It's not durable at all. So we need something uh, stronger when we want to interact with an end user. Um, if we want to validate the fact that a data is durable or not. It's a kind of F-sync, if you know the F-sync in, uh, in a file system, where you propagate synchronously all the cache of Linux to the file, uh, to the file system, to the storage. OK, so we need another instruction, which is p-sync. So a p-sync is just like a p-fence. Uh, it prevents any reordering. And uh, the p-fence ensures that the cache line is actually propagated to the non-volatile memory if the, when the next instructions execute. Well, take effect, if you want. So just I replace my p-sync with uh, my p-fence by a p-sync here. And here my code is correct, because if I send the message, it means that OK is equal to true. If OK is equal to true, it means that my p-sync was executed, and my cache lines are written to persistent memory. No, I have guarantees that uh, 
my data is durable. OK, so we just need three new instructions. And that en that's enough. We can play with that uh, to, to, to build systems uh, in persistent memory. OK, with the Pentium, how you can implement that? So you have all the instructions exist on the Pentium. Uh, PWB is implemented with a cache line write back. Uh, it's an instruction that is uh, provided by a Pentium for years. Uh, because the, sometime we want to, to, to manage our cache line manually. And it's very useful to say, OK, I want to propagate this one or this one. OK, for the store fence, uh, the P fence is implemented uh, with a store fence because the store fence in the Pentium just defines that any instruction that has a store effect uh, is a, it gives the order between the instructions that have a store effect. And a PW, uh, a cache line write back is an instruction that has a store effect. So the store fence already prevent the, order, the reordering between the cache line write back and the read and load and store instructions. OK. And PSync is implemented with a store fence, uh, store fence also. Uh, I don't know if it works. Probably. Uh, you have a long uh, discussion on, uh, by mail uh, that we can find uh, on the internet where engineer from Intel say that if we have a crash and we called PWB, in this case, the Pentium will have enough residual energy to propagate the cache lines. I hope that it's true. I don't know. So we can suppose that the hardware is correct. Probably. I don't know. The, the basically, why it works, they have a reason, is that the, the cache line right back actually send really the, the, the data on the bus uh, when the instruction is executed. So as soon as the instruction is on the bus, the, the, the cache line will reach the memory controller of the persistent memory quickly. And the, um, the memory controller just take the data and write it immediately. So we can suppose that we will have enough power just to actually write the, the cache line when it, when it arrives on the, the memory controller. OK, that's all. Now you will have to implement your own uh, persistent memory system. Um, I hope that you, you will like that. Uh, so just to, for the takeaway, uh, a persistent memory is just a memory, uh, but that gives durability. Uh, you have the performance almost of a volatile memory, so two times slower uh, at the end. <coughs> um, just to say, um, another usage of persistent memory is to save power. Uh, it's an interesting usage. Here, I used my persistent memory as a storage uh, to store data, actually. Uh, we can use a persistent memory to save uh, energy because the, the a persistent memory is slightly slower than a volatile memory, but consumes uh, less energy. So it's another usage of the, the persistent memory. Uh, in Linux, the persistent memory is exposed uh, with a file system abstraction. So with open, read, write, close, you can access it. And uh, you have the direct access mapping, direct access uh, that allows you to directly access the content of the persistent memory. And then you need three new instructions to enforce the ordering when you work with your persistent memory, which are PWB, PFANCE, and PSYNC. So that work. So I don't know what time is it. Oh, perfect. You will have two hours, more than two hours to do the lab. So for the lab, I enjoy labs. Uh, I know that you are all doing theory uh, most of the time, but sometimes it's cool to, to implement uh, what we do. Um, so to find the lab, it's easy. You have to write CSC5101. On the internet. And the, the first link 
Uh, I hope that it will be the first thing for everybody here. Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, on Slack. Ah, I don't have the. I will use my. Uh, you can do it. Okay. I have a Slack uh, about uh, non-volatile memory. <laughs> Not a good one. Okay, the, the, maybe Pierre, the, give the direct link to the lab. Uh, not the non... Na, 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 this one. So the basic idea to explain the, the, the goal of the lab, what you will do, you will implement a, a producer-consumer uh, at the end in persistent memory. And we will use it to boost the performance of uh, disk, disk access. So uh, you will have a thread that wants to write something on the storage. The thread will write the data in persistent memory, which is small. So we will just use the persistent memory as a booster. And we will have another thread that I named the, the cleanup thread that takes the data from the queue and apply the modification to, the, to a hard drive, a slow hard drive. So just by writing the, the data in, in persistent memory first, you will have durability immediately. And then you can have a very large storage uh, when you propagate your data after. So it's something that we made with Rémi Dulon uh, two years ago. Uh, so you have the paper, the full paper here. And you will only implement the write part, not the read part. Because the, uh, at some point, we will have uh, a queue where we have data that are, it's a log, uh, where we write data. And we have the content in the files. And uh, they will not be the same. So to read data, we have to retrieve them. And you will not do, do that. You will only implement the write function. And you have some code here. 